Kelsey, our guest today on the first 50 pages is incredible. Her biography is simply amazing, and her latest novel, The Evening Hero, was picked by Oprah. You heard that right, Oprah, as one of the top books to welcome in this spring season. Marie Young Oakley is an acclaimed Korean-American writer and author of the novel Somebody's Daughter. She has also written many successful young adult novels as Marie G. Lee, including the groundbreaking and recently republished Finding My Voice. Lee was the first Fulbright scholar to Korea in creative writing and has received many honors for her work. She is one of 50 journalists who's been granted a visa to North Korea since the Korean War. In addition, Ms. Lee is a founder of the Asian American Writers Workshop. She lives in New York City. Marie Young Oak Lee, welcome to the first 50 pages. Oh, thank you, Kelsey and Jen. And thank you so much for the respect with which you're making sure my name is pronounced correctly. I really, that just really warms my heart. Our so pleasure. <laughs> yes. So we, as librarians, we want to get it right. Yeah. It's a little bit well, of a compulsion. We have to, we have to get it right. Well, do you want to know why I'm not Marie G. Lee anymore? And it's not Yes, it's not yes. a secret ethnic like awakening. It's super funny because you guys as librarians will understand and find this hilarious where sometimes when I explain this, people don't quite get it. Um, so, you know, I vote. So my full name, like George Herbert Walker Bush is Marie Myung-Ok um, Grace Lee. So Myung-Ok is my second first name. Grace is my middle name. So when I start publishing, I just went by Marie G. Lee because that's kind of how what's on my IDs and so forth. Um, but then when I wrote my first adult novel, um, Somebody's Daughter, we were having some problems that we were seeing because there, you may or may not know, there is a really famous writer who writes these series of Cape Cod skull mysteries. Her name is Marie Lee. And she's much more successful than I am because <laughs> I know because I was getting her mail for quite a while oh, and wow. these statements and some of her fan letters. Yeah. And then what it turned out, you know, this is obviously like pre-internet. But um, so our ISBNs in books in print, which you guys know what it is, but books in print used to be yeah. like the Bible mm -hmm. of what the, where like when you order books, but our our names and ISBNs got switched. So we were literally like that was a big problem. Yeah. In Ooh. terms of, you know, like ordering books and everyone's like, wait, why is there a skull on your books? Why? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, so my publishers were panicking a little bit because this was a last minute thing that they had just become aware of. And so I thought, oh, my God, oh, my God, like what what? Like, you know, we're going to go Marie Gracely, da 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 that doesn't. So I was just like, let's let's use my other first name, Marie Myung Oakley. And that immediately stopped everything. I don't get the the white lady Marie Lee stuff anymore. Oh. It work. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's the only reason. And I kind of like it because when I spent all this time in Korea, um, my relatives would call me Mori with, for Marie. And Mori actually is a homonym for head. Okay. And the worst thing, my husband's name is Carl. And when you say Carl in Korean, it's Carl. So if you put Mori and Carl together, it's like haircut. <laughs> and I just got really sick of them making that joke. Yeah. So it's just yeah. easier than like, okay, my this is maybe funny the first two times. And then like, exactly. all right, let's leave it alone. Yes, I don't. Yes, exactly. So, so it's kind of fun to have my full first name. Yeah. And then, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, you work so hard on like bringing something to publication. You're like, we're going to have my name, my stamp on this. It's not going to be confused with anybody else. Absolutely. freaking lutely <laughs> So your latest novel, The Evening Hero, has been called Moving, Captivating, and Profound. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about how this novel, about this novel and how it came to be? Well, first I will say it's about like 450 pages. So as an author, it's always a little difficult um, to concisely do this. But I guess I could say the book starts with a not quite elderly Dr. Jungman Kwok, who he's come to this tiny town of Horses Breath, Minnesota, more than 40 years ago, and then finds out because of for-profit medicine that his hospital suddenly closes and he's out of a job. And at the same time, a letter arrives that could expose some secret that he has been working his entire American life to maintain. Um, like many immigrants, he's come to America with a fresh start and he begins to wrestle with the large questions of his life in America, not the least how for-profit medicine has closed his small rural hospital. Um, but then in order to keep working, you know, he's in his early 70s, he ends up at his doctor son Einstein's really weird 
for-profit startup at the Mall of America where he's paid minimum wage for, um, to basically laser off women's pubic hair. And he's trying to figure out what, what you know, like what is going to be the rest of his life? Um, you know, is he going to have a reckoning with his longtime racist neighbors or the racism he's faced at the hospital? And then also there's the big, the, the book cuts back and forth back to his childhood, like something that he did as a child in North Korea was bad and he felt like he left it behind. I remember as a kid also wondering if I did something bad, if I just waited one day, another day, would it actually go away? But for a young mom, these letters are showing that somebody back in Korea still remembers and it's really up to him. Is he going to do the easy thing and keep ignoring it? Or is he going to face down a secret and its messiness? And I will also mention for your readers that the secret will be revealed by the end. <laughs> um, I am actually, so the book is divided into like separate books, like, right? There's like yes. book one, book two. So I am through book one. Like I am now through um, the part where Yung Man um, is, has become a doctor at this Re, I, I don't, and I'm not even sure how to pronounce that. Like, it's like retail medicine, like mm-hmm. yes. retail medicine. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm like, and this is, and I'm, it's a, I'm, it's a concept, and I'm like, does this exist right now? Like, I, you know, and it, it there really is really praying. a lot like to think about. <laughs> like, you know, when you talk about, you know, some of these elements, you you do explore some heavy themes in the book. Um, including anti-Asian racism, how war trauma seeps into everyday life for an immigrant, and rural hospital closures and the future of medicine. And yes. Kelsey and I often talk about the power that stories can have, especially in the hands of skilled writers like yourself, um, building empathy and understanding for people whose lived experiences are different from our own. And I think that the Evening Hero is a really beautiful example of this. Um, and I found myself, you know, even just through the first section of the book, thinking about these characters, their experiences, their struggles, and their survival. And I know there is so much more to come. Like I'm excited. <laughs> I I find myself like trying to pick up the book and and keep reading, but it really gives you a lot to think about. Um, it's almost like you have to like sit with it a little bit. Like you do. let me read through this part, and then like okay. Yeah. I think about how that made me feel. What should I you know, be taking away from this? Yeah. It, it's really beautiful writing. But I wonder, uh, Marie, what do you hope that readers will take away from this novel? This sounds super simplistic. Um, and I guess you are right. The novel is like really long and it has different moods. And it actually is almost like three books stapled together. <laughs> um but one of the things within the writing of it, it, it originally was more of a a social novel, a satire. I'm a big fan of Middlemarch, um, you know, and there is like a lot about small town life and a, the doctor who's trying to do the right thing. And I was also very influenced by Sinclair Lewis's Main Street, also about small towns like in the Midwest. And so it, it was going to be a little bit more heavily on the the you know like the mall of america and like retail sin and the weird startup bro culture but one of the reasons this novel is taking me 18 years to write is it has evolved also with culture in after the 2016 election so i also grew up in a really small town that is not unlike um Boris's breath um, i grew up in hibbing minnesota which is also bob dylan's hometown after so my my father is sort of um he's not he's not what young who young man is based on but my father is old was also a doc a longtime doctor he was the anesthesiologist who is arguably one of the most important essential doctors in a practice in an isolated area because for any surgery or birth or accident like he's the person who needs to do the job and a lot of american born doctors didn't want to do the job they didn't want to have to live in a place where they're on call 24 7 and could never drink and um if my father ever wanted to do anything he'd have to hire like a temporary doctor and pay him you know it was like it was not the best doctor situation particularly my father had a very like illustrious academic career before he came here 
So, but, you know, you think of my father's pretty much had hands on like every single person in our town. So after the election, um, on my Facebook group, someone had very proudly posted their bumper sticker, which said every day, and this was also the time when Trump was kind of going around saying we have to bomb North Korea. He's kind of saying that like every day. So this bumper sticker said every day, 152 species of animal go extinct and North Koreans should be next. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. How do you react to that? uh, Right? And so the takeaway for the book suddenly pivoted for me to becoming, how do I show that North Koreans are human beings? I mean, so, and some of this was inspired, like the book was already kind of done and it had this separate plot, but you know, my, both my parents are also from North Korea. My, my father was born in Pyongyang. Like unlike Youngman being born in a village, my father was um, born in a in the capital. Uh-huh. Uh, but the idea of the, that you don't even know what a North Korean looks like, do you? <laughs> because uh, you wouldn't be saying this because without my father, like much of the healthcare in this town would have collapsed. Mm-hmm. So this like, you know, the idea of the disconnect or even when I'm with my father, just seeing how people look at him as this little Asian guy that they can be racist to or just push aside and don't understand that this epic story. So I sort of lead into that a little further. Um, the Einstein story became more of a background. And ironically, Jungmann's story was more like I'd written as filler, you know, for the kind of funny story. But then Jungmann's story came to the fore. And then it also made me want to just do more of an epic story of what is what what is different than what you see. It's sort of like how we just really don't know people, even like our children. You see one thing, but there's so much more behind that. And then also the other thing that I felt like it had to change in 2016 is I feel like as artists, you kind of like absorb or reflect or even predict culture. And so in some ways, there was no way to not address the election, climate change. Um, there's a very light, like sort of reference to pandemic because you, you know, to some degree, in 2016, a lot of culture changed, and there was no way to write a kind of near future um, book without acknowledging that. And my my problem, my like challenge is <laughs> the other reason why the book took so long is how could I do it in a way that it's still near futurey, so, but we don't. It didn't have to be stuck in a year, which is why the years are are like 20 XX. Like we kind of know where we are, but kind of not. Yeah, you have a quote um, from your writing on your website that is really um, fantastic. And it's as our past and present American attitudes towards immigration have shown countries and their people have differing ways to receive their fellow humans in need children we tell ourselves are resilient. What we don't think about is that one's worldview becomes formed in this period and early experiences, even if not understood, maybe especially if not fully understood, become part of the things carried into adulthood that haunt a person every day. And yeah, I think it's very relevant to the times that we live in. Oh, definitely. You know, we think we're going to have so many more refugees from Ukraine and so forth. And that I think it is a little bit of a too easy mental shortcut to just offload everything like kids are resilient versus war trauma in particular is something that gets passed down. And they've actually shown scientifically it's so bizarre. They have shown if they sort of like, I don't know, harass lab rats and then they're smelling a certain smell at the time they're harassing them i don't know like giving them electric shots or something that two generations after that those rat offspring will avoid that smell Hmm. isn't that weird it's like like it gets into your cells so in a weird way that's kind of what i was trying to convey even without knowing like there's oh there's science behind it but just this idea that trauma is something that 
that permeates everything. It's not like, oh, I'm resilient. I'm over it. Like I'm over like what happened to the war. I'm over the fact that my father disappeared and I never saw him again. You know, but it's not like a one to one correlation. It's not like young man's like on Father's Day, he flips out or something. It really is just more. It becomes part of the texture of his life. And I yeah. I hope that is where I was able to express. Yeah. yeah, that it might not necessarily like stop him in his tracks on like a daily basis that like you learn to live with it. But it doesn't mean that that trauma is not there. Or you're not feeling with it, feeling it and experiencing yes, exactly. it. And that it's not exactly. just like, oh, one generation. OK, we're done. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? Really? So not to go in a lighter direction, but as I've been reading this story, I've been struck by the humor in your writing. There's definitely an undercurrent of satire, which you've mentioned a little bit throughout The Evening Hero. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of humor in Korean storytelling and why it was important for you to incorporate that into this book? One thing that I loved is, um, I won't use the profanity on air, but my (laughs) editor that this book is effing funny and it became like this quote that some of the booksellers are using they're like can i use this as a shelf tag and i was like well uh, i better ask <laughs> but that uh, you know the idea that oh you can't you caught on to this idea that this very grim book about war and trauma can also be very funny and to some degree i didn't, I didn't necessarily mean it to be funny but it it grew really organically for two ways one of one of it the, one of is the Korean War now, when you look at like, you know, the number of people, you know, like seven, you know, three million people probably died. You know, all these kids got orphaned. Um, 99% of North Korea was bombed, but 96% of, of South Korea was also like bombed to smithereens. Um, we are, as historians, actually st- sort of um, edging towards calling it a genocide. And in fact, in the New York Times Review, which is reviewed by an Asian person, um, that person for the first time used the word genocide in the review. And so I was kind of happy because that's kind of what I am getting at without getting too grim about it. But at the same time, just like in Korean culture, no matter how awful something is, Koreans always have find some weird humor in everything. And that's one of the things that I've always found like sort of sustaining being Korean or I don't know if you watch any Korean zombie movies. Have you seen like like Train to Busan? <laughs> no, I but I feel like but... I need to just by you saying Korean zombie movies. <laughs> well, it's kind of like so in um, in sort of like a George Romero, like a classic zombie movie. The zombies like you know just kind of terrorize everybody. But in a Korean zombie movie, first Koreans are very the, the zombies run because Koreans are overachievers. Um, so the zombies like <laughs> run everywhere and they're really fast. But then there'll always be like one moment of slapstick, like someone will trip on something stupid and get eaten by a zombie because they did something <laughs> stupid. And there's always like these weird moments. Do you know what I'm saying? Like there's a yin yang, mm-hmm. yeah. and in, to some degree, or even like in Parasite, like some um, Bong Joon Ho's movie that became so such a crossover hit. There's there's little moments of fun despite everything. And in some ways, like this yin yang pull, I feel like allows you to just see it more in a more rounded complexity rather than, you know, there are there are great war novels where the tone is always very serious and that's fine. But I just feel like for this book and also Young Man too, just has kind of a uh, very dry sense of humor. Humor is a primary I agree. Humor is a primary part of this book. And actually, even on my Amazon thing, it said, you know, it categorized it as like humorous books. And I was kind of I was like, great. That's that is one of the the goals that I had to write, not write a funny. It's this is Slaughterhouse Five. But, you, you know, you understand, like, there's somewhat of a vibe to that. Yeah. To make it fun, <laughs> to make it fun. And to some degree, it makes it funner to read, in my opinion. And a little more compelling because you're you're like. Well, here is this very serious story and all of these serious things to think about. But then what might happen next? Mm-hmm. You know, um, book exactly. Li- yeah. Book list. Um, I'm not sure where it. I came across this, but I just have some notes that they said of your writing. Joy mingles with sorrow and heartbreak is laced with hope. And I think that that was a really great way to describe a lot of your scenes because they're serious, but yet there is still something more. Mm-hmm. You know, like you said, it's not so depressed. You know, it, there's there is this, you know, this survival, this continuance, this 
you know, hope for for better things, um, which is really powerful in the writing. Thank you. Thank you. And I think some of it has to do with my own Buddhist philosophy, because no matter what is happening, you always have the now. And there is inherently joy in the now just because you're alive. I love that. Yeah. Um, Another fun quote that you have on your website um, talks about kind of how you got into being a writer um, from inheriting an old typewriter from your older brother. Um, would you be interested is, in, in <laughs> telling behind me right now? Yeah. <laughs> that typewriter, yes. Yeah. Um, so do you want to tell us that story? Would you be willing to sure. tell us that no, story? No, I'd be happy to. And, and then, I'm kind of laughing because these type, this typewriter is going to be long gone, even if the earth is gone, if like Elon Musk blows it up or something. <laughs> this typewriter is always going to be here. It's from 19... <laughs> my parents bought it when they came to this country in 1953. Wow. So my dad could write um, his resumes um, when he was trying to find a job. Um, so... You know, and actually I was quizzing. I was actually just um, talking to high school students. And it's so funny how they have very little conception of what a typewriter is, but at least they know that it exists. So yeah. I can, I think your listeners um, will largely understand yes. that. So my, um, so it got, I have two older brothers. One of them is eight years older. The other is four. So it kind of went through, you know, a series of people. And while, you know, I had already been writing stories, I, you know, in pencil, my friend would illustrate them. They were 99% about horses. That was my big thing at the time, They're <laughs> mysteries. So when my brothers were like, eh, here, you can take this. I think they probably got electric typewriters or something at the time. So this is a royal, quote unquote, portable typewriter. I think it weighs probably about 30 pounds. It's amazing. You have to really push down the keys. And so I was like, oh my God. So I wrote my first story on the typewriter and it looks so freaking professional. I was like, <laughs> wow, it looks professional coming right off the plat. And so I, it was three hole punch. I bound it in yarn. I was like, trying to sell it to my parents. They paid me a quarter, possibly it was a nickel. But then I just thought, you know, this is the only thing I want to do for the rest of my life, literally. And I remember I was nine and literally, I just thought I'm going to write every day. I'm going to train myself to be a spy and memorize dialogue. Um, and so everything I have done, including actually dropping out of pre-med and becoming an economics major and working on Wall Street has actually been in service to a larger plan for me to have a somewhat sustainable writing career, including being able to spend 18 years on a novel. So, and and in case anyone's curious, yes, I still have a day job. I yeah. am not a full-time writer. Okay. Good to know. Interesting. <laughs> um, so you had to have a love of reading, I think, before you decided you were going to be a writer. Oh, absolutely. Um, so absolutely. who were some of the formative writers that sparked your love of reading oh. and stories? Oh, my goodness. So I will be totally honest with you. I mean, be totally honest with you. You guys are librarians. Um, but I will mention I had a bad librarian experience. We're talking about how oh. little kids respond to stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, so what happened when I was in sixth grade in the school library, so I was always checking out these gigantic stocks of horse books, you know, how to take care of your horse. Yeah. You know, American Girl Horse Stories. Why not, for some reason, the librarian got really got on my case and said, and maybe because I was little, she said, you can't read these. These are too hard for you. And, you know, I already read, read these before. And I was all, rah, rah, rah. and so I said, no, I want to take these books out. And she said, well, then you, she just opened a book and shoved it in my face. Like, you have to read this in front of the class. And of course, I get super stage fright. So I was like, ah, <laughs> just I couldn't really read it. And then she's like, see, I still remember snatching them away. See, I told you you could read these. So she grabs the whole pile away from me, you know, and I'm sitting there going, ah. So I had the, I, this be, thus began my love of reading, but I also had librarian phobia. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so we had a beautiful public library and apparently a very sweet, wonderful children's librarian for whom I was like, not going to risk a second, <laughs> a second interaction with. So I would immediately run to the adult stacks and just grab stuff. I don't know. I just skipped the whole children's book thing. Yeah. I ran to the adult stacks. And I will also mention, um, a lot of my librarian friends say, this is very common. There was also a flasher in the stacks. <laughs> um for which I would find after I took books out because I could see them on the other side. So I would oh. just grab whatever I could just grab and literally judging books by their covers. 
Um, so some of my earliest stuff when I'm 11, yeah. <laughs> Tessa the Duberry, but I also Ooh. discovered Sidney Sheldon. <laughs> and I thought, this guy can write. <laughs> oh my God. You know, I did not understand. Oh, I, I also got Value of the Dolls. I thought it was Oof. actually about dolls. <laughs> um, that so had to be I an interesting reading. awakening. <laughs> well, I did learn a lot about how do you keep a reader engaged? Yeah, I true. Was like, Whoa, this is not, where are the dolls in this? Where are the dolls in this? But this is so interesting. Or, you know, even in Tess, so much of it went over my head about what was happening to her. Um, so it was basically that. And then um, in school, we were all passing around Judy Bloom books. Yeah. And yeah. so... I think um, with my young adult novels, I think you can very much see that some of them are an homage to her truthfulness um, and her very wonderful sort of straightforward writing style. And then, you know, and then when I was in college, I majored in economics and but partly I did that because I could take more classes at Brown. Economics was was actually the discipline where you needed the fewest number of core classes. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was great in religious studies. We had to learn, we had to read Flannery O'Connor, um, just, you know, like Walker Percy. And so that would be, thus became my completely chaotic reading career. So I was reading just anything I get my hands on as a child, and I still do that now, yeah. I guess. So you should have seen both of our faces when you were telling us that you had a horrible librarian experience. We were both like, <sighs> we had this like disgust and sadness yeah. on our face of like, no. Who did that to you? <laughs> Librarians are the best. That's why I love YA conferences because I feel the safest and most comfortable at like ALA at American Library Association mm -hmm. conferences. I'm like, these are my people. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I think it's, you know, with any profession, someone who's really invested in it and cares and gets sort of those founding philosophies, you know, is good at it and can impact somebody's life profoundly for the better. But if you don't get it, you can also impact somebody's life profoundly for the worse. So, I mean, it's, you yeah. know, I think it's important to hear those stories. Yeah. You know, it's important to yeah. hear those stories because, you know, we want all librarians to be good librarians, but obviously they are. <laughs> right. And, you know, I'm in my 50s and I still vividly, I actually yeah. still remember her name, oh. which I will not say now. We won't shame won't that shame person publicly, but... Yeah, it's <laughs> just a reminder that library that we can have profound impact yes. on people. So you are one of the founders of the Asian American Writers Workshop. Can you talk to us a little bit about your work with this group and its importance to you? Sure. Um, so we kind of just started as a bunch of friends. Actually, we were all um, ex pre med <laughs> friends, and I had also just quit my job at Goldman Sachs to try to become a, a writer, like a more full time writer. And because I had been working on Wall Street for six years, I had zero cohort. Like, I love literature. I moved here, you know, I worked on Wall Street so I could live in New York, but I didn't know how to find people. Um, and luckily, my friend Christina Chu said, Oh, you know, I'm joining this group. We're all Asian American. You want to come? And so fine. And we just met in this restaurant. But then I, it just felt so amazing because at Brown, I had taken a single workshop and that's back when, you know, I didn't have a very good sense of my self identity. So I was very much like, I'm going to mimic all my favorite Flannery O'Connor stories, despite the fact I am not a white lady um, who's Catholic growing up in the South. So I was writing these very technically proficient stories that had no pulse. Um, sure. And any time I tried to write something, though, you know, I had joined a couple of writing groups in New York. And every time I tried to write something sort of Asian, um, ever it would just be this weird um, marginalization. Part of it was um, this had happened to all of us. Amy Tan's book was kind of the first big Asian American book, and it just come out. But the hegemony of it became either I had heard about the same work and this is finding my voice. Oh my God, you write just like Amy Tan. <laughs> and then, you know, two minutes later, they, why don't you write more like Amy Tan in this book? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Or where's, where's the rice? How come the character doesn't eat rice? And so we were all just um, making these jokes and going like, oh, we don't have to talk about this yeah. because we kind of, we all get it. And it just became more 
like it's not it's not about being an arbiter of what's asian american literature it just be it was just more like we're asian americans this is our literature we write this oh we all applied to be in this anthology they rejected us all we're in our own anthology we, it just kind of escalated from there yeah um and then we did a reading and what was kind of crazy so this was in 1992 um, so it was actually exactly th- 30 years ago, and we w- we did a reading at the Chinatown History Museum. And back then, um, okay, for kids um, who are like internet natives, we did not have the internet. Yeah. Today there was a reading. There used to only be this thing called the poetry calendar where they would print all the stuff going on in New York City in microscopic font, you know, like the <laughs> kind you get with your drugs. Um, but they'd cram it all, and it, you got it free in these bookstores. So we we put our little reading at the Museum of the Chinese in America, but like over 200 people showed up like it got it was so crowded that um, there we had gotten like warnings about the fire codes and stuff. But then we realized, wow, there is actually a need for this. Yeah. So from then, we as complete loonies, <laughs> um, we just started a 501c3, but we had no you know what I mean? We had we didn't know how to be professionals about it. We didn't know like we shouldn't start a first board with just us, like just the writers. And me as a financial person, I was the first board president. And then I was telling Curtis, our executive director, oh, wait, we're financially liable for this. Like, what is you know, <laughs> so completely goofy? And then later, you know, we got a more professional board um, and we're still, you know, we all left probably in about 1996, 97 was when the new sort of, you know, a, an organization gets to evolve and yeah. it it's has a slightly different cast to it and it still exists um because it's been wonderful there's been a need for it um it's been made into a you know like a national organization that has a lot of and that has a lot of influence and in in what i think is really important i think what's really important that it does is it helps protect and nurture the literature so that we can have more of it it it's not even about Oh, well, we have our one like Indian American author. It really is just more like if it's more difficult. So people can skip some of the why don't you write like Amy Tan or some of the stuff that makes it more difficult to share your work. Um, And so, you know, writers like Monique Tron came in going, I'm a lawyer. I don't know if I can be a writer. And she actually had her first piece to one of our journals rejected. But then she came back and she got better. And so we kind of feel like, you know, almost there was one early workshop where it was um, Min Jin Lee, Ed Lin, um, Lisa Ko, Kathy Park Hong, um, probably Monique. And it was taught by the then unknown person named Jubal Lahiri. <laughs> so yeah. it's just been this place where a lot of people have passed through and our founder, Curtis Chin, um, is just now because we kind of joke, but it's not 100% of a joke. We've all we all gave our 20s to this organization, so we're all at least one book behind, given the <laughs> amount of time it took. But Curtis mm. just got um, he has a memoir coming out. Um, he just got a contract, and I had a launch party last night, you know, for my nearest and dearest. And he came in from LA, and you know, and Christina was there too. And just to have, in some ways, the, the one of the most important parts is having showing that these literary friendships where there, where everyone is 100% supportive, you know, there's no literary jealousy. Literary jealousy is, as you probably know, a big problem um, yeah. or an endemic, an endemic kind of toxic emotion that exists irrespective of where you are. So I'm just, you know, appreciating even more that I've had these people who've been with me this entire time. And then the writer's workshop is is just sort of our, is is almost like our own baby that's 30 now yeah. and of course we haven't aged at all but yeah no, no. yes but how I, I just think it's wonderful to have that community um you know for artists and activists to you know share ideas um and and critical dialogue um it i, I think it's great Oh, definitely. And, you know, one of the sort of happy, sad things is that before we had an office, because, you know, now we have like a really nice office in Koreatown. And, you know, we before we had infrastructure, we're like, where are we going to meet? And we met at the Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence um, on the Lower East Side. And that organization still exists as well. And that organization exists because obviously we still need yeah. that. Mm-hmm. 
And even then, you know, it was actually near one of those motorcycle gang hangouts. So we just have very vivid memories as well. We all, we were all thought we were super tough. So some of us would wear motorcycle jackets, but then when the actual motorcycle biker guys would say racist stuff to us, we would just kind of quietly cross the street. <laughs> you know, and just go to our meeting at the Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence. Yeah. And so, do you know what I'm saying? Like, there's this kind of weird continuum of deja vu of all, about all this right now. Yeah. So yeah. you seem to be quite active on social media, you know, posting on most platforms. On one of your posts, you mentioned that social media can be a portal for creativity, you know, not just a place to post the latest dance trends. Um, can you talk about this idea a little bit and how you see the role of social media evolving for artists? Sure, I do. Um, I feel like I have a kind of plan the way I use social media. Some of it is fun. Some of it is just merely I have a brain dump that I just, you know, and I'm also back to the workshop. Um, social justice movements have also been a really important part of it, you know, we went to so many demonstrations and so forth. Uh, we also feel like art cannot exist, does not exist independently of social justice. So a lot of what I do, you know, is about organizing and doing certain, like getting things out on social media. But at the same time, for instance, um, part of what I consider now to be my social justice work is I write a lot of op-eds, um, especially about immigration or racism or I don't know, cannabis legalization. And my Twitter feed is very carefully curated. So often I can write an op-ed fairly quickly because the way it's curated, not only do I have people um, whose opinions I trust, but I also can get a read, I guess, culturally on what's going on just by what I see in the feed. And so, and then Facebook is more, you know, we share pictures and are silly. And then I make a lot of requests on Facebook. A lot of times it's good for cross crowdsourcing. So if I'm going to write a piece on abortion, I'll just say who's had an abortion and who wants to DM me about it. And it's very effective and the goofiest thing. So I, and Instagram is, is a lot of pictures and I enjoy that creativity creatively because I also feel that by doing other creative things um, that just opens up, you know, kind of a different perspective for me. So I enjoy Instagram. And then um, actually some of my publicists said, you don't have to go on TikTok, but of course I want to do that as well. And it's super goofy Besides, I don't, you probably didn't see my post about on Twitter about how I was trying to learn running man. <laughs> watching TikTok. <laughs> some of it is like really silly, but at the same time, um, there's interesting, that algorithm is very different. And it, that is one way that, I guess the, a lot of before the internet, I was very magpie like, and I would keep these gigantic binders, which I would often take to writers' conferences to show people where this is kind of how I get my ideas. And it would be completely weird, chaotic mashups, mm -hmm. you know, of, oh, this is like this weird OBGYN um, instrument. And then why is there a picture of George Clooney here? I don't know, he's <laughs> handsome. It would just be this random, but a lot of times by looking at this random scrapbook, it would just help me make weird connections. And sometimes like making unlikely connections often is the strongest points in writing when you're able to make like these weird metaphors and so forth. And so for me now, I just feel like this is just supercharged way for me, you know, by liking and pinning stuff. I just have like this gigantic scrapbook on the cloud. And sometimes yeah. people like have amazing dialogue and especially on TikTok, they see <laughs> stuff. I know. Surprisingly, I'm kind of enjoying the TikTok myself. <laughs> I don't right. really post I'll anything, but it, the algorithm is pretty interesting just to see what it pulls up for my For You page. I'm like, well, didn't know I wanted to live on the coast of Canada and redo a cabin or like, you know, exactly. didn't know I needed to follow this author, and, you know, find this book or I don't do the dances, though. I'm, I'm with you on that one. But there is the book, book talk. Is yeah, cool. book talk is huge. there is certainly a lot of influence. And we do see people come into the library asking for those authors that they see on book talk. For so, sure. That's amazing. Yeah. Especially if they wouldn't normally a lot of it seems like a lot of people who normally wouldn't read are like, oh, it's not a sad book talk. Yeah. So here I am. And that is thrilling. Yeah, it is kind of fun to see him sing it, see it bring readers back to the library. Like when maybe we had one or two books by that author. And now it's like. Oh, we need to buy the rest of them because there's so many right. holds the and seven requests. Seven husbands and... of Evelyn Hugo. You need like a hundred copies now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's so great. 
Well, thank you for joining us today on the first 50 pages, Marie Young Oakley. It has been a pleasure to have you as our guest.